For our next feature inside of our type system that we want to add, let's add objects and fields. So what we'll do is we'll extend our language E so that we have forms of the form. Um, uh, a field name is X, and there can be many of those. And then we can write object E dot X. So these are our two new features. There's a new kind of value, which is when all of these are values. We're going to change our type system so that there's a new type, which says that X is of type T, and then there's a bunch of those. Let's look at a little example program. Uh, we could write the example, we could write the program um, distance from origin, and it would take in um, something that had an X which was a number, and a y, which was a number, and this would be called p, p, and we'll return p.x squared minus p.y squared. Okay, so that's a little, that's a, a function that we could then call with distance from origin and give it the value x is 1 plus 2 and y is the value 3 plus 4. All right. So how can we uh, how can we do this? Well I hope that it is fairly obvious what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to say that Let's start, let's start that down here at the bottom. That gamma proves that x, e, x1, e2, dot, 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 xn, en, has type x1, t1, dot, 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 x2, sorry, xn, tn, if... Gamma proves that E1 has type T1 through gamma proving that EN has type TN. So all we're doing is we're saying that each one of those things have to have a type, and that's the corresponding type. We'll also have a rule that's going to say, let's put it right here, that says that gamma of E dot X has type TI, Let's call it dot xi if gamma proves that E has type x1 t1 dot 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 xi ti dot 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 xn tn. So what we're saying is that E has to be some object that has that type right there. So this is a very simple way of describing objects. It would ensure that this program right here, distance from origin, can run. And it would ensure that if we tried to run distance from origin on just three, then it would fail. And it would fail because three is not an object. This type is not object. However, it would also fail if we called distance from origin on x is 3, y is 7, and z is 8. Now the question is, it would fail on this, but should it? Is it okay that it fails on this? There is a lot of different opinions about whether a program like this should be okay. And um, the main question is, what are types supposed to do? So recall that types make predictions. That's one thing that happens. 
So a prediction that we have about the type system is that this p dot here will have a field named x and it will have a field named y. That's what this says, that p, I predict that p will have a field named x and p will have a field named y. And that's why it passes on this, it's why it fails on this, but it seems weird for it to fail on this, because this does have a field name x and it does have a field name y. See, when we make those predictions, we're making a prediction that the typed program doesn't crash. Typed programs don't crash. And this program right here does not crash when we call it with so this program right here doesn't call it when we call it with does not crash when we call it with an object that has an x, a y, and a z. So what should we make of that? Is that okay or is it not okay? Well, from one perspective, we could just go back to saying that, well, there's all sorts of correct programs, and only some of them are typed. And that's fine. Okay? So this rule as I've written it is fine. It basically rejects programs that are correct, i.e. that don't crash, but it's, you know, we could imagine a better system. All right, so let's imagine that better system. So how could we, how could we write that? Well, it turns out that we actually don't need to change either of these rules. Like this rule just says that if something says that it has fields x one through xn, then its type is x1 through xn. And this one says that if you look at the xi field, it's got to have an xi field. Where does the error really happen? The error actually happens with function application. Because our function application rule says that when you are applying a function to an argument, you're going to return the range and the type of the function has to be domain arrow range, and the type of the argument has to be domain, i.e. this thing and that thing have to be perfectly equal. And so something that has an x number and a y number is not equal to something that has an x number, a y number, and a z number. So that is the problem right there, saying that they have to be equal. So instead of saying that they have to be equal, we can change this to the following. So this is our old rule. So we can make a new rule. Our new rule is going to say that gamma proves that f applied to a has type r if gamma proves that f goes from x to r and gamma proves that a is a y, and we're going to say that x and y, x and y, are compatible. All right? x and y have to be compatible. Now, what does it mean to be compatible? The rule that we're going to use for compatible, x and y are compatible, is going to be what's called the Liskov, Liskov substitution, substitution principle. This is named after Barbara Liskoff, a Turing Award winner. The substitution principle basically says it says um, it says Y is compatible. with x if any program 
expecting an X will not crash if given a Y. Now, right here, this is a concept in human, right? This is a, this compatibility idea is a human idea, and we're expressing it slowly mathematically by saying any program expecting X will not crash if given a Y. Let's think about some like real world analogies to this. Imagine that I asked you to, uh, oh, sorry. And notice that compatible with is like in a direction. So we're going to write it in this way. We're going to say y less than colon x. So that is going to mean x is compatible with y. This is called the subtyping relation. Now let's look at some examples of this. Imagine I went up to you and I said, will you please watch my dog for me next weekend? And you say, yeah, that's great. Imagine that I show up and I have a Rottweiler. Well, you said that you would accept any dog. So it makes sense that Rottweiler is compatible with dog. Because every Rottweiler is a dog and you said it was fine to watch a dog. However, imagine that I said, Will you watch my Rottweiler? Sorry, will you watch my Rottweiler? And I showed up with a, I don't know. Well, actually, imagine I said, will you watch my Chihuahua? And then I showed up with a Rottweiler. It would be rude for me to say, well, it's a dog. Because the thing is that you were expecting a small dog, and I've given you a big dog. Okay? Here's another example. Imagine I said, will you watch my pet? Well, you should be prepared to come for me to come with any animal that's a pet animal. I could bring you a snake. I could bring you a dog. I could bring you, you know, a horse. I, I guess, a, you know, I'm not sure if horse people think that horses are pets, but whatever. Okay? So if I say, will, will you watch my animal? Well, like, I could bring you a lion. You know what I mean? So how can we express this mathematically? Well, what we'll do is we'll have another judgment that's called the subtyping relation. And it's quite straightforward. It's going to say that T is a subtype of T. Boom. Okay. It's also going to say stuff like F cross G is a subtype of, um, of A cross B if F is a subtype of A and G is a subtype of B. It's also going to say that F plus G is a subtype of A plus B if F is a subtype of A and G is a subtype of B. Okay, so those are kind of boring rules. The rule that we really want to use this for is for objects. And here's the rule for objects. It's a little bit long. Let me uh, give myself a little bit of space. Move this up. Okay. All right, this rule is going to say that F0, T0, dot, 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 Fn, Tn is a subtype of g0, t0, dot, 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 gm, notice that m and n are different, tm, if, what's the deal? Okay, so when is it the case that one object is compatible with another one? So any program expecting an x will not crash if given a y. So notice that Rottweiler is compatible with dog, but dog is not compatible with Wattweiler. Okay, 
because I can't give you any dog if you're expecting a Rottweiler. Nor is dog... Sorry. Uh, but dog is compatible with animal. But animal is not compatible with dog. Okay, so what's the principle here? Well, if I tell you something is an animal, you don't know a lot about it. But if I tell you it's a dog, you know a lot more than if it's an animal. The set of things that are animals is very, very large. But the set of things that's dogs is smaller. And the set of things that are chihuahuas are even smaller than that. And the set of things that are my chihuahua, Mickey, is even smaller than that. So as we add information, adding information makes the set smaller, the set of things. Therefore, the thing that has less information is the larger thing. So what that says is that F is compatible, sorry, this object right here, the Fs, are compatible with the object G if the things that are inside of F are contained by G, meaning that G is less specific than F, but they agree on some stuff. So essentially the way that we write that is we have to say that there's a set that contains F0 through T0, dot, 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 Fn through Tn, and that thing right there has to be a superset of something that has G0, T0, through Gm, Tm. Okay, so let's look at a really concrete example of that. So we want to know whether or not, whether or not x number, y number, z number, whether that is compatible with x number, y number. Because notice that this is the y, and this is the x. And if we go back to our function application rule, it says that x is the given type, and y is the one that you're actually trying to call it with. Okay? So, that's the case if x, y, z is a, sub, is a superset of x, y, and it is. It's actually not only if the, the names are the same, they have to have the exact same values. If we wanted, we could make an even more complicated rule. And this more complicated rule would not say that the, um, just that the function, sorry, just that the names have to be uh, this, uh, sorry, let me say this again. Right now we're saying that, like imagine that F0 and G0 are the same. We're saying that their types have to be exactly the same. But what we could do is we could say that their types have to themselves be compatible. So we can make this rule more complicated. All right. However, the more interesting rule for when things are compatible is when we call, when we compare two functions. Compare two functions. Okay. So, imagine I have a function that goes from x to y, and I want to know if that is compatible with a function that actually here we'll do it. we'll write it this way. Oops. All right. We have a function that goes from y domain to y range. And we want to know if that is compatible with something that goes from x domain to x range. 
So what this means is that our program thinks it is going to get an x domain to x range function. And we want to know whether or not it is okay to give it a y domain to y range function. All right, let's consider a concrete example of this. Let's imagine that we have a function that, that we want to take in an animal and return a number. Maybe it returns the weight of the animal or something like that. And we would like to know whether we can give it a cat to number function. Is that okay? Let's think about that. There's some function f, and it's supposed to get a function called weight. And this function called weight is expecting animals and it will return numbers, okay? And then inside of here, we're gonna call weight on a dog, and we're gonna call weight on a cat. Is it okay to call this function right here, f, and provide it a cat arrow number function? Of course not, because if we sent in a cat arrow number function, we would be sending in a function that must receive cats always. So it has a special, you know, cat weight detector that only works on cats. But we're going to send it dogs. Maybe we're going to send it whales. You know, I have never tried to weigh a whale, but my guess is that you have to weigh a whale differently than you weigh a cat. But if you can weigh a whale, then you could probably also weigh a cat, okay? So what that tells us is, is that this right here should say no. That should not be compatible. And the reason why it's not compatible is because y domain has to be a subtype of x domain. That's right because cat has to be a subtype of animal and and okay I think it's the other way around yeah. I'm let me just double check we're back. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, so I'm right. Um, that xd has to be a subtype of yd. Because we would have to say that animal is a subtype of cat, and that's not the case, which means that it's not okay. Alright, so this isn't okay because it violates this rule. Next, what we have to do is we have to think about the ranges. So let's imagine that this function took in animals, and what it did is it returned an animal. Sorry, animal and returned, not a number. Let's say that it returns a, uh, a number. And this one takes in an animal and returns a positive number, OK? Is that okay? Well, this function, we're going to send in animals. Okay, so we're going to call it with whales, we're going to call it with cats, and we're going to expect to get back some number. But we're actually going to get back only positive numbers. Well, we can deal with that because positive numbers are just special cases of numbers. So that means that yr should be a subtype of xr. Now notice that this rule, right, this part of the rule is a little bit strange because we flip the sides of these things. 
you know, with these, the F's and the A's stay on their own side, but over here, the X's switch. This, they switch for the exact same reason that they switch inside of contracts with blame, because this position right here is a negative position, so it needs to switch the responsibility of who knows what is supposed to happen. All right. Anything else about subtypes? Ah, uh, yes. There's another thing that I want to say about this. What I have described is something that is called structural subtyping. So I'm going to say here that structural subtyping is us, i.e. theory, i.e you know, the J language. Structural subtyping is also implemented by many other languages like Haskell and ML and Coq. I wrote Cog, but I meant to write Coq. Okay. So all those languages use structural subtyping. However, there are other languages that do it differently. And what those languages do and these languages are C++ and Java, for instance. What they do is they have a really, really simple subtyping relation. They say the following. They say that um, Y is compatible with X if X and Y are equal, and Y is compatible with X if Y inherits from x. So what does this mean? In C++ and Java, the only values that, uh, sorry, the only types that are involved in the subtyping relation are classes. And all of the classes are arranged in a, in a hierarchy. For instance, object has, you know, it has windows, and it has lists, and it has animals, and then animals have dogs, and cats, and lists, you know, have array lists, and linked ones, and so on. And so all the objects, all the classes are arranged in this hierarchy, and the only things that are in the subtyping relation are things that are involved in a chain in the hierarchy. So array list is a subtype of list, which is a subtype of object. Dog is a subtype of animal, which is a subtype of object. Now, what, why should this be surprising to you? Imagine that I had a class in C++ called POSIN, that's for position, and it had three fields, int, x, y, and z. Sorry, x, y, and, x and y. Then I have another class that's called POSIN3D, and it has int, x, y, and z. If I don't explicitly make it so that POSIN 3D inherits from POSIN, then they are not going to be compatible, and I'm not going to be allowed to call a function and give it a POSIN 3D when it expects a POSIN. This is called nominal subtyping. Nominal means by name. The idea here is, is that it is not the structure, i.e. the contents of types, that determine whether or not they're compatible, but is their names. There's a particular name for a type, and that name totally determines how it is allowed to be used. Now you may notice that I didn't put languages like Python and Racket and JavaScript and stuff like that on either side of this divide. And the reason why I didn't do that is because those languages don't have type systems, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about them this way, because they don't, they don't uh, restrict um, programs in any way. However, um, it does make sense to, uh, to think about them as being subtyped in a certain way, and that's that kind of they're over here in the structural subtyping world. Python, JavaScript, Racket, and so on. And Sometimes horrible people call this duck typing. The idea of so-called duck typing is that 
there's this phrase where people say, if something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. What they're trying to say is that let's not worry about the origin of objects. Let's not worry about how they inherited from one thing or something like that else. It doesn't really matter where an object came from. All that matters is what things it can do. If it can quack and it can walk, then it must be a duck, because all I really care about are the things that I do to the thing. Well, that's a really structural subtyping kind of idea. Like I said, it's not literally structural subtyping because there's no actual type checking involved, but it's, uh, it comes from a very similar place. In contrast, we could imagine a language that was untyped, like Python, JavaScript, and Racket, or something like that, where you had to explicitly name uh, like the interfaces that were being involved, and um, you had to explicitly use one of them, um, and they were like not compatible with each other otherwise. Um, so I'm not really sure a good example of a language like that, but that, that could exist. So there could be like an untyped version of this nominal thing. Um, in some ways, like the way that Swift protocols kind of is like this, um, but you know, yeah, it's not a, it's not a perfect analogy. All right, so um, I think that's all we need to say about subtyping. Yeah, I think we're I think we're good with that. So we'll see you next time.